I'm here because I got like invited and I didn't know this was happening and I missed the entire conference because yesterday I was like walking all over Aston like trying to like get the materials and today I was up in the workshop. So I basically have no idea who any of you people are or what I'm doing here or what any of this is. It seems like a good scene, but it's not my usual kind of scene. So I'm very glad to have been here. It's been a good experience. My usual way of doing things is like going to a place, working with people directly, staying there for like a month or two months. Um, and, and again, <clears throat> it's a matter of doing everything from scratch. So every place is going to have different needs. There's not really any kind of concept of scalability in this. There's no like solution for everything. Everything is different. So I've got some like some basic models which I know basically function and are very adaptable and localizable. And most of the work goes into localizing them. So like um, either doing something from scratch, which takes a lot of time, or just deploying something, but then taking a bunch of time to, to get it making sense in that situation. Um, so usually I'm in like a squat or an autonomous center or like a village or like a favela or working directly with the people, like basically with the end users, like the people who actually need this stuff. And that, that includes like, you know, like Western settings, like, you know, when I'm in Australia as of tomorrow, um, I'll be doing like workshops there, getting these things plugged into like Australian suburban homes, like the, the cooling system, uh, the solar hot water system is gonna make a lot of sense in Australia. Like in Australia, um, on a, on a hot day in Australia, which a lot of them are, a third of the nation's energy production goes into um, running air conditioners. And that's because the buildings are basically English village homes that they put in a desert, painted the roof black, insulated nothing, mounted a massive air conditioner on the wall in a country with very expensive electricity, and then we're like, why are my power bills so high? And it's because you live in a stupid house for stupid people, you can't have a black roof in the desert and then complain, like, and it's just because of fashion. Like, it's just like, oh, I'll make the roof black because my neighbour has it. So, what's a heat wave? It's um, kind of makes no sense. So, um, I have like a air conditioning prototype, or well, like an air cooling prototype, which is just like a twenty litre bottle of water that you bury two metres in the ground, where the temperature is fairly regular, about ten, eighteen, maybe twenty degrees. You suck the hot air out the top of your house uh, with some kind of basic air pump. Um, which can be powered off a wind turbine or a solar panel or just plugged into the wall. You bubble the air directly through the water as a heat exchanger and bring it back into your house. And this will cycle your house probably in about three times a day. Um, and because you're not generating coolth, you're harvesting an existent source of coolth from your environment, which is underground, um, shallow. You're not really doing much work. So the, the power required to do this is like, low tens of watts for like 30, 20 30 watts you can have this you know thing like ticking over um so something like that in australia makes a lot of sense and so i'll be like i've already prototyped that i'll be workshopping that and like teaching people how to make that themselves and then if everybody if everybody had one of those um then theoretically the maximal sort of power savings on australia's power production for, you know, infrastructure, which is mostly coal because it's Australia, um, and nuclear, would be cut by a third. Just for that, just like burying a, like a, like a bottle in the ground and like, you know, blowing air through it. Yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. And this is sort of like the, I, I generally work towards the low-hanging fruit kind of side of things because like people will go into like a situation like, and will like select a place to go based on certain criteria and then really make what they're doing work there. I just sort of go to a place and if it's like going to be easy for me to be there, then I'll stay and work. And if I don't have what I need to work there, I'll just go somewhere else. Because there's not like all of the need is concentrated in a few places. Everywhere you go, I mean, like, you know, you walk out the door here, there's need. You go to like London, well, I mean, London especially, Jesus. There's huge amounts of, you know, homeless people and like, you know, fuel poverty and like actual poverty and like... You don't need to go to like the really like famously needful places. You can go to the place which is easiest to work, find all the need that you need there, but also the things will make it easiest to work. And then once we've solved 80% of the world's problems, then we can start focusing on the places that are like actively resistant to being helped. So I'm just like, I just go after the, the easy targets, basically. Um, yeah, and there's, there's no end of things to do and work to be done. Renewable energy is not a thing that I specifically work towards. Um, it's more a matter of accessible energy. So 
the energy that exists in the environment of the people who need it. I mean, if I don't really have anything against coal and diesel and that sort of stuff. Like, if a country had like one coal power plant for the whole country and everything else was something else, we wouldn't be having this whole conversation about fossil fuels because the emissions would be so low that we just wouldn't care. It's that there's a huge focus on fossil fuels. And so we have to think of alternative energy as being the alternative to the mainstream. Really, it's mostly when you get down to like just, you know, the majority of the human population, which is people living in remote areas or like sort of very um, basic urban areas. It's about just harvesting the energy that's in their environment and coal, diesel, all that sort of stuff is just more difficult because it's more expensive, there's more embodied energy in it. By the time they have an opportunity to buy it or whatever, um, the price has been had to meet all the overheads of the entire process of getting them. So solar and wind just falls for free out of the sky or hydro or whatever like that. So it just makes more economic sense and practical sense and technical sense and ergonomic sense to um, focus on those energy sources just because they're so much closer to the, to the person who would be, be using them. So renewables, I mean, it's, it's important that the energy source renews itself just because these people don't necessarily have much money. And so having an, the abundance of energy that these, that these sources represent um, just makes it, it just puts, them, it puts it on the table as an option for them to, to, them to harvest. But then they need the apparatus, like the, the, the harvest equipment basically, to you know, collect the solar, the wind, the, the, the whatever. So the wind turbine that we built today as a workshop here at the, at the forum, um, it's a lens two type lift and drag vertical axis turbine. Um, it was developed by Mr. Ed Lenz a couple of years ago and he sort of broadcast just like the, the basic shape of the thing and also some wind tunnel data about like efficiencies and stuff, which is quite high. It's about 35 to 40% mechan mechanically efficient, which is very good for a, for a vertical axis turbine. Um, and it will compete with a decent horizontal axis turbine. But whereas a horizontal will really suffer um, with any turbulence in the air or changing wind directions or like lack of clearance before and after, um, the horizontal will take like a huge performance hit, whereas the vertical will take a much shallower hit. So it'll, it'll do a lot better. So if you're in an in a open field with a steady wind, horizontals are great, and that's why they use them in, in wind farms and that. But if you're anywhere that people actually live and work, you're going to have buildings and trees and, and obstructions and stuff. So a vertical is going to do much better, providing it has the same kind of efficiency and you can get the same kind of power out of it, which this will give you. Um, so Ed Lenz broadcast the the design itself, did all the hard engineering work, and then someone put me on to like the, the, the results, like the numbers and, and this thing, and like um, that all looked good, and then I was just looking, looking on the forums at people who were making these things, and they were saying, yeah, it's a good design, it works well, but a vertical is always gonna be a bit harder and more expensive to make than a horizontal, because horizontals are very easy to make, usually. Um, so I was like, if the, if the physics is there, and it just needs to be cheap and easy to make, then that's just, that's just design. So you just design it to be cheaper and easier to make. So that's, that's basically all that I've done. So the bill of materials, I, I call it the $30 wind turbine. Actually, that's sort of a conservative kind of figure. It's closer to 2025 for a full six vein version. Um, you need a drill, a rivet gun, a couple of like, you know, knives and pens and like very, very basic tools. There's no welding, there's no um, electronics in the thing itself. But if you attach it to you know external things to be powered, then you, there's a range of options to, that, that it will um, that will do. It will do um, 30 watts mechanical in a 20k wind, 130 in a 30k wind, 450 in a 45k wind, a kilowatt in a 60k wind, and I think four and a half kilowatts in a 100k wind, because um, the power goes up by the cube function of the wind velocity. So on a windy day, you get a lot of power very quickly. Um, but if you buy a $600,000 wind turbine, just like off the shelf from China, you'll get this much of that wind. So like most days aren't very windy, you won't get much. I mean, here it's quite windy, but in a normal place. Um, and when that sudden like spike in energy comes through, 
if you've just got the one turbine, you're not really effectively taking all that energy very quickly. If your turbine costs 20 bucks, I mean, once it's got like a generator and, and stuff attached, like 50, 60 dollars, you can have 10 of them of the same size and the same efficiency for the same price. And then you have 10 times the capacity. So then you can like harvest all that energy very quickly in the, the, the time that you have it, store it in some way, which can be electrical battery storage or run a refrigerator mechanically off it, which is another prototype that I'm working on, store the energy in the form of cold in an insulated box, keeping your, your, you know, your food and your vaccines cold. Um, you can pump water uphill, you can compress air, you, you store it and then you live off that energy while you're you know, not having this abundance in your environment. And you can like tag in solar, solar thermal to, to like even out those curves. And that's basically the, the dynamic is just taking the surplus, harvesting the surplus when you have it, which is very much the, dynamics, the dy dynamic with renewables that you have a lot very quickly and then not at all for a while. Um, and then storing that in some way and just like you know, living off it basically in between the, the spikes um, in availability. So there's a very large division between western suburban homes and developing south homes, I mean obviously. Um, a western suburban home will consume about 12 to 18 kilowatt hours per day. Um, somewhere in the global south will be I don't know, a tenth of that, less than a tenth of that, depending. Um, so when, I mean, you see like these things like, you know, this wind turbine will power your house for a year and stuff. It's like that kind of makes no sense and also is definitely not true if it's, you're talking about like my house, like, you know, there's no way. Um, but for people in like developing world, global south sort of thing, um, yeah, probably will. If there's enough wind there, some places have wind, some places don't. Um, so if you've got, say, 20 kilometer hour nominal wind, you've got one turbine, which if you had one turbine, which is doing 30 watts, that's, I can't do maths in my head, what's less than a kilowatt hour per day, um, 0.72 kilowatt hours per day. Um, that will run lights, it will charge devices. Those are the two like, you know, killer apps in, um, in the developing south. Then you can add in more turbines or have more power. You can add in other you know, sources of energy. Um, I've just been working in Guatemala the last seven months on a solar hot water panel and cook stoves, obviously, because everyone does cook stoves, cook stoves. Um, but also a gravity vortex um, pico hydro turbine, which does about 200 watts, but 24 seven when the river's flowing. And so that will do bunch of power enough that you can like power your farm and then start trading the power to nearby farms charge people's batteries that come in establish little sort of like you know micro and pico grids and like charging facilities and you know start to and it's also portable so like because it just doesn't it's you know it's a cone basically with a tube that goes in and water that comes out um and a generator so people can like take that to like remote farms and remote remote, remote work sites and um have like basically the equivalent of a diesel generator, which can then be used in just the same way. You just chuck a tube into a river, and then, um, but isn't running off diesel. It's running off you know water that's just flowing past. So, the turbine will power X amount. There's not really. I mean, people. I mean, this is always the question that people ask. And it's like, the turbine itself is quite standardized. Like, you follow the tutorial, you have the turbine, it's much the same as everybody else's, although it's open source, so it's free to be adapted and improved on. Um, everything that, ha so that, that's a tutorial or a workshop. Everything that happens after that is a conversation. You need to like find out how much wind you have, what are you trying to power and how, under what conditions. And there's lots of, lots of options that cover like the whole spectrum of that through from like, pulling a little motor out of like, you know, a windscreen wiper from a car or something through to like, you know, proper, this will actually make sense under a Western, like sort of, you know, suburban setting um, and everything in between. That's all very, very well mapped out, but you need to have that conversation, do like a little, a little design. Um, so this is why I have, so I have the tutorial on the website. People have made the, with the turbine from the tutorial. Um, but then I also have like a Facebook group to be like, okay, we've got the turbine. Now what? And it's like, okay. Here are the basic questions. Let's take this forward from there, and people can like chime in with advice and stuff. Um, but there's there's not a one size fits all sort of like solution, which is a shame because um, 
it's nice to give people one size fits all solutions. Just like a recipe, follow the recipe. At the end, you'll have the thing. You'll understand the thing better when you've made the thing. You don't need to understand it to start it. Because most people aren't engineers, but they still need the stuff. So I design so that you just follow the recipe. Like the, 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 the whole thing is built for physical outcomes, like, you know, like, like, you know, the, the, you know, the power output and that sort of stuff, but also with the ergonomics of production, material sourcing tools needed built into the structure of the thing, and that's where most of the work goes. Um, and so it'd be great to be like, here's a whole thing, a whole schema start to finish, but it's just not a possibility because everyone's, everyone's situation is different. Um, but the, the bright side of that is that there's not really any unknowns in there. No matter what your situation is, there's going to be a bunch of op um, options that you can just sort of tap into.